Good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Kirti Agarwal, second year student from Electrical and Electronics Engineering, BBD ITM Lucknow. It is my proud privilege today to welcome you all in this inauguration ceremony of the Institution Magazine Volume 2 and the webinar on engineers' role in public policy organized by IEEE student branch, BBD ITM Lucknow. On behalf of IEEE BBD ITM, student branch, I extend my warm gratitude to everyone who has been supporting us and attending the program. Thank you for joining us today. Please take a quick look to the instructions and then we'll proceed further. Here is a glimpse of our branch events we, uh, IEEE has been organizing. Most now, I would like to invite our Honorable Director, BBD ITM Lucknow, Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chauhan, for the welcome address. On behalf of the management of the uh, Institute, Shri uh, Mati, Honorable Chairperson of the Educational Group and the President of the Education, Shri Bira Sagar Daji. Uh, as well as all the faculty of the institute, uh, my faculty colleagues and uh, the students. I welcome uh, Professor Russell, who is a highly decorated uh, professor and of course an inspirational figure to all the electrical engineers. He is a fellow of a different prestigious body. And uh, it's really an honor to have you on the uh, forum, and I'm sure all the students as well as faculty members will be benefited out of this session. So it's really uh, very gracious of you to accept our invitation greatly and to, uh, you know, bless with your address at such a time because this is uh, right now, you know, uh, late night, uh, in fact, early morning, in, uh, it's around 3.30 as I am told. But you have been so kind enough to really uh, bless and, of course, spare your uh, time uh, to address the, this gathering, considering the theme and the purpose of this meet. So I congratulate all the organizers of this forum. And since the institutional magazine will also be released, so it's really a, a, a major event in our institutional calendar. And uh, I'm sure it will give a lot of energy to all those who are associated with the institute. Thank you very much and over to the anchor. Thank you so much, sir, for your motivational and kind words. Now, I would like to invite editor, BBD ITM, Institution Magazine, Professor Dharmesh Shivasta, to share a few words. A very good afternoon to one and all. Our assistant professor, Department of English, Babu Banarsidas Institute of Technology and Management, Lucknow. Feel highly delighted to speak as an editor at the release ceremony of the second volume of the B of BBD ITM's news magazine. As we all know, that there has always been a team effort in order to have a good outcome. Each member of a particular domain tries to give his or her best for the same. I feel happy to state that along with my responsibility as an editor, co-editor, review committee, department heads, department in charges, department editors and reviewers also work as a team with mutual understanding. And as a result, we are now ready to have the release of the second volume of our Institute's magazine. Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chahan, sir, Director BBD ITM has always played an indispensable role as the captain of the ship. He has always steered us through all the difficulties, thick, thing and things, thick and things, and made us land safely in all the ventures that we had undertaken. To work as an editor is always a great challenge for each one of us, and especially for the editor, uh, because you are on high expectations by everybody. Checking of text, formatting, language rules, editing and proofreading the document and making the document presentable for publication by doing necessary polishing, refining and filtering in the text by all the challenge, challenges, it involves all the challenges 
and i would say that i have tried to do justice with my assigned responsibility as an editor and in future too i will try to do the best of my skills in my responsibilities although a oh, well cordial welcome has already been given to our honorable chief guest professor russell harrison director government relation i triple e usa by our respected director sir yet being the editor of the news magazine of the institute i to extend my deepest gratitude in welcoming our honorable chief guest professor russell who not only gave his consent but also spared his precious time for us in having gracious release of our news magazine at his pious hands i owe my sincere gratitude to you sir for accepting our request as the chief guest at the institute's news magazine release ceremony thank you very much sir for being with us and doing us this honor thank you so much sir for being with us now thank you so i would much. i would like to i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to director sir for having envisioned institute's news magazine and provided me the opportunity to be the editor i thank you sir for believing in me i think i have had carried out my assigned responsibility with all my devotion and dedication and i believe that i will execute my duties in the same manner with all devotion and dedication in the future too i would also like to add on the kind and sincere cooperation of the co editor assistant professor department of electrical and electronics engineering bbd itm dr khadim moin siddiqui sir who stood by me and contributed his endless efforts in providing concrete shape to the entire outlook of the news magazine had he not with me the magazine would have not received its final shape thank you very much sir for your genuine support all throughout i also would like to extend my gratitude to the review committee members professor dr professor d s ray head department of civil engineering professor suresh patel sir head chemical engineering and dr shivangi tiwari assistant professor department of management bbd itm for their critical remarks for their indis indispensable role as uh, the reviewers of the magazine had they not been such a such a reviewers we would have not been able to give the final shape and uh, the the stained role to the magazine and uh, we would have not come to this stage of the re release of the magazine without them so thank you very much reviewer committee for your kind support i also extend my sincere gratitude and thanks to the department heads department in charges on all faculty persons involved in compiling and procuring news magazine data it was just because of their unconditional cooperation and immense coordination that first two volumes got its concrete shape at this platform i also believe that i would again receive the same kind of support from you all please keep on extending your kind support like this with us in future too i would also like to extend my my humble gratitude deepest sincere thanks to the honorable chairperson madam babu banarsi das educational group shrimati alka das ji for having her conviction in this venture she she has always been excessively generous in extending her full fledged support in all curricular and co curricular activities of the institute thank you very much ma'am for your kind cooperation i would also like to Uh, uh, give a message before i conclude and i would like to convey this message to all the department heads department in charges faculty members involved in organizing compiling editing and proofreading the document containing information of their departmental activities for the news magazine that new guidelines are formed for drafting the text formation text information after the consent of the director sir
according to the incorporated rules. This will help each one of us to have a uniformity in the text form information which would be sent by the departments for the magazine. With this message, I conclude and thank you all. Thank you all for such commendable uh, job, so for, for such cooperation, for such um, uh, gratitude that you people have shown as such a humble uh, gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for your words. Now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our honorable chief guest, come speaker, Professor Russell Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA, the American component of world's largest technical professional society. Professor Harrison has been with IEEE USA since 2004. He worked for the Institute of Scrap Recycling, Recycling Industries, the American Iron and Steel Industry, and the American Trucking Association. He has, a ma he has a master's in public management from the Uni University of Maryland and a BA in political science with minors in history and communication from Allegheny College. He is a certified association executive and planning commissioner. Over his 16 year career with IEEE USA, Professor Harrison has spoken to over 260 local state, national, and international groups about engineers' role in the public policy process, making him one of the most accomplished speakers within IEEE. Now, I ingloriously invite Honorable Director, Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chauhan, PBD ITN Lucknow, to kindly request the Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Russell Harrison, for releasing the Institution Magazine, Volume 2. I, on behalf of all the institute, I request uh, uh, Professor Russell Harrison to kindly inaugurate uh, this uh, magazine, the third issue of this magazine. And uh, I once again for a sense of deep gratitude towards him. And uh, uh, along with me, all the faculty members are there. So, sir, please kindly proceed with the release of the issue. Thank you. It is with, it is a great honor and with great pleasure that I announce the magazine to be released. Thank you so much, sir. It's a humble request to the Honorable Chief Guest, Ms. Professor Harrison, to share a few words for which we'll be highly obliged. Thank you. Um, first, I. There we go. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous honor to be able to join you all today. Um, I want to explain a little bit before I get into my remarks exactly what I do for IEEE. Um, my team and I work out of Washington, D.C., where we work directly with the United States government uh, to help the government form policies, laws and regulations that affect um, engineers and all of society. Uh, we are the eyes, ears, and voice of engineers in the United States. Uh, it is a unique and I think very important role uh, for IEEE to play, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. Um, but I, it, it's, it's a unique honor for me to be able to join you today because your magazine can play that role as well. It can play the role of helping you communicate with the public and, more importantly, with policymakers in India to help them understand uh, and use technology to solve societal problems. I'm gonna flip screens here real quick. As engineers, your job fundamentally is to solve problems. It is fundamentally to see technical challenges facing businesses uh, and develop solutions for them. That's what you're doing, that's what you're training to do. But society has problems too. And I would suggest to you that as engineers, you have a unique and vital role to play in solving society's problems, as well as solving company and industry problems. If you think about kind of the challenges facing governments today, 
um, an increasing number of them have a technical component. Um, cybersecurity, uh, smart grid for powering, you know, building modern electrical grids to power cities and towns, even exciting things like space exploration and quantum computers. Policymakers, lawmakers, and uh, in India and the United States and every other country are confronting technical challenge, uh, excuse me, policy challenges that require an understanding of technology to solve. Yet the vast majority of our policymakers don't have that background. They don't have the technical knowledge they need to, for example, understand how to deliver clean water to, in your case, a billion people. It falls to engineers to come up with the technical solutions to solve those problems. But it also falls to engineers to make sure the policymakers get that information when they need it so that the policymakers can make good decisions. But I think it goes beyond just that. It goes beyond providing policymakers with solutions to technical problems. You see, the technical, the policy problems that are confronting our lawmakers have societal challenges as well. But those societal challenges, which are not strictly technical, require a technical understanding. For example, let's look at autonomous vehicles. Just as a random policy to put this in context, autonomous vehicles have great technical challenges that have to overcome, things that you are all learning to deal with. Um, you know, you got to, how do cars communicate with each other? How can they understand their surroundings, interpret their surroundings? How do they respond to unusual circumstances while driving down a given road? That you all understand. But they also have societal challenges, legal challenges. For example, um, how do you, well, some flaws in our autonomous vehicles, at least at first, and still let them be on the road if we ever want them to be on the road. But determining how safe they can be requires technical understanding of what exactly that means. How do we evaluate how safe cars are? How do we evaluate how safe they can be? For policymakers to confront those challenges, they're going to need technical information from engineers that most policymakers won't have, and it will fall to you to provide it. I think engineers have four roles to play in the policy process. Uh, one is simply solving technical challenges uh, for society. How do we provide clean energy to society? That's a technical question. How do we, you know, solar panels and windmills and hydroelectric dams and things like that. I think most engineers understand that and are ready to take on that challenge. But you also have a role providing technical expertise to policymakers to solve these societal challenges like we've been discussing. We also play a role in simply educating policymakers about technology, what it can do, what it can't do, what are the limitations, what are the strengths, what are the benefits of technological solutions, and what are the challenges. Lastly, you have a, we have a unique role and I think a vital role to play in maintaining the public's trust in technology. Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction writer, a very good science fiction writer, as a matter of fact, wrote one of the many smart things he's written, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what he meant by that is that at some point, if technology gets far enough ahead of a given individual or a given society's understanding of that technology, it might as well be powered by magic because the public simply can't understand it. I think that's broadly true. If you think about our cell phones, which are fairly magical, the idea that we can have almost all of the world's accumulated knowledge at our fingertips in our pocket at all time is miraculous, or perhaps just magical. And for most of humanity, they are never going to be able to, un be able to understand how that cell phone really works. 
But here's the problem. It is human nature to mistrust things that people can't understand. That when a person, phrase that differently, to most people, one of the scariest things there is, is the unknown. Things that they cannot comprehend, they cannot see, they cannot understand are inherently frightening to people. But most of the public will never really understand what it is that you do. And most of the public will never really understand the technology that you're building. Which means I think we have a problem. Because as technology gets more and more advanced, as you do the great work that you are planning on doing in your careers, developing the technologies you plan to develop, helping the companies you plan to help, you're pushing the limits of technology further and further ahead of where the average citizen is. And as that happens, there will be a natural tendency to start to distrust what it is you're doing and ultimately you. And I think that's a risk. That's a threat, really, to engineers' plans for the future and a threat to society itself because you have the ability to make society better and solve society's problems. But because you, like I, live in a democracy, you can't solve society's problems without their permission. And it's going to take a certain amount of effort on our part to keep the public trusting us enough so you can do what it is that you plan to do. Because if you don't, if we don't, if we get too far ahead of the public and stretch the public's trust in us too far, they're going to make us stop. And that would be a loss for everybody. And so I think you have, we have, IEEE has, a role to play in forming public policy and helping policymakers do a good job finding technical solutions to public problems and perhaps more importantly, helping the public understand and trust those solutions to public policy problems. But to do this, we have to take the initiative. Policymakers in India, in the United States, I suspect in all countries, are bombarded every day with people that want to talk to them, to explain things to them, to convince them of something. Policymakers generally are not going to put the effort into coming to us for information. We're going to have to go to them. And that means speaking up. That is what IEEE USA does in the United States. I know that IEEE India is starting to do this in your country, which is fantastic. Where we take the initiative to go to policymakers, to talk to them about what we're doing, talk to the policymakers about what the policymakers are doing, and help them understand technology enough to make good decisions. Give you one quick example. IEEE USA hosts a, what we call our Congressional Visits Day, our CVD, every spring. Well, not this past spring because COVID didn't let us. Uh, but for the last 27 years, we've invited every IEEE member in the United States to come to Washington, D.C. for two days to talk to their elected society. It's a way of allowing engineers to sit literally across a table from members of the United States Congress to talk to them about what it is that we do. These sort of projects, and we do lots of other things like that in the United States, but mostly we work to get actual engineers talking to lawmakers. And what we found is that when we do this, policymakers are very interested in hearing what we have to say and listen to us. Not, you know, all the time, but more often than we think. Because as it turns out, most policymakers understand that they need to understand technology 
in order to do what they're doing, that they need to understand how technology interacts with society in order to solve the problems that they have been, that they have been hired to solve. But they also know that they don't have that information. And so when we go to present it to them, they're very receptive. IEEE, and frankly, your magazine, has a role to play in that process. I think IEEE plays the role of helping to bring engineers together to give you a forum, to give you a structure to talk about policy, to talk about how technology interacts with society, and then gives you the tools you need to organize yourselves to start communicating with policymakers. That's what IEEE USA does in Washington and in the United States. And I know that IEEE India is starting to play that role to start developing communication tools to work with policymakers. It also gives you the, the, an opportunity to learn how to communicate with non-policymakers, how to write, how to edit, how to explain things in writing, which is a skill that is different than what you do in most of your classes. Uh, communicating through writing is, is something you have to learn and it's something you have to work on. And it's, it's hard. And frankly, there aren't a huge number of people that are good at it, uh, which is why I think this magazine is, is such a great asset to your school and a great opportunity for you. Lastly, I just want to point out that the policy world offers you opportunities as speaking directly to your students, opportunities for careers uh, and, and in some cases very rewarding ones. Throughout government, from the top level national government down to local governments, there is a need for people who understand technology and understand how to use it and understand how to use it for society. In addition to actually, you know, using and developing technological solutions, advisors to policymakers, lawmakers, to help them understand policy and help them in implement the laws and regulations that will govern those policies uh, is a great opportunity for engineers that want to look for something perhaps a little bit different. Uh, this op offers you a fantastic opportunity to do important things with important people, uh, to do exciting challenges, to tackle exciting challenges, uh, to solve them for society. You get to meet some very interesting people in the policy world. Uh, which, as an aside, is one of the best parts of my job, uh, is I get to meet IEEE members, policymakers, people in other organizations that are sincerely interested in making the world, this country, their local community, a better place, and working with, with them to do that. And so the policy world gives you an opportunity to meet with some very interesting people. And engaging the policy world, engaging our lawmakers, regulators, the mayors, the governors, members of your, your, your government, engaging them gives you the opportunity to occasionally, in rare instances, but sometimes, to legitimately change the world, which is a very, very exciting thing. I'm going to try to, I didn't share my screen because I didn't want to use the bandwidth, but I'm going to pop up a screen now. Doo -doo -doo. Try to do that at least. I'm thrilled that IEEE was given an opportunity to join you all today. Uh, I think IEEE is a fantastic vehicle for coordinating IEEE, uh, engineering efforts. Um, particularly in the policy space. I've been thrilled to see how IEEE India has been getting organized and has begun engaging policymakers in your country. I think that's enormously important both for India and IEEE and frankly the entire world. As a representative of IEEE and a representative of IEEE USA, uh, it is a tremendous honor to be able to join you today. And I hope that this event today is just the first interaction that I, between your school, your students, your magazine, and IEEE USA, and ultimately IEEE more generally. You have a unique role to play 
in your country's development and in the development of the entire world. And I hope that IEEE USA, my team, and IEEE more generally can help you do that. Uh, my name is Russ Harrison. I represent you in Washington, D.C. before the United States government. It is a tremendous honor and a tremendous joy to be able to be your representative before the American government. And I hope that we can work together on the technological challenges facing both of our societies moving forward. Uh, my phone number is on the, on the screen, but perhaps a better way for you to contact me is my email, which is r.t.harrison at ieee.org. It is a tremendous honor to be able to join you today. I wanna to thank uh, Shrikant Singh in particular for helping to set this up. Uh, and with that, I will open myself up to questions. If, if anybody wants to talk about what IEEE USA does or particular policy questions facing your country or society. And I'm gonna flip back to the general view so I can see all of you. And I'm not quite sure, do we wanna do yeah. questions or do you wanna move on to something else in the agenda? Uh, yes. uh, sir, uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, suppose uh, uh, suppose uh, I am an engineer and uh, uh, we are making an autonomous vehicle. And in the autonomous vehicle, uh, there is no driver. So at that time, if accident occur, so who will be responsible? Means uh, technology and uh, if driver is not there, then so uh, for policy makers, if we have completed that project, then how uh, we will interact with them? Uh, means uh, it is uh, uh, if it's, uh, it is uh, running in the road and everyone is secured. So uh, can you give uh, your ideas in this talk, please? So this is this is actually a very hard question to answer, right? If the car does not require a driver, and let's assume in this hypothetical case that the driver was not actually, the, you know, the person who owns the car was not actually doing anything to control the car. They were perhaps not even sitting in the driver's seat, which by the way is part of the question. What is the role of the driver in the operation of the car? Is the driver required to pay attention? Are they required to have their hands on the steering wheel? Does there have to be a steering wheel? Uh, these are actually the technical questions, but they're also policy questions. Uh, and to give you an example of this, it may be possible in the not too distant future to um, build a car that does not require a steering wheel. that can do everything by itself, and so the steering wheel becomes unnecessary. But then it becomes a policy question whether you can actually get rid of the steering wheel. Perhaps you have to keep the steering wheel to allow the driver to intercede if the autonomous systems fail. Or perhaps you want to get rid of the steering wheel. Perhaps we can conclude that the autonomous systems are better drivers than the driver is. And therefore you want to get rid of the steering wheel because the car becomes safer at that point. So these are the kind of policy questions that lawmakers have to decide, but they can't decide without technical understanding of what the car is capable of and not capable of, which will require an engineer. Which brings you to your question, how do you assign responsibility in an event of, of an accident? And you know, there will be accidents. Let's assume for the this discussion that the vehicle was at fault, that you know, it wasn't another driver or you know, some other obstruction of an animal in the road or something that caused the accident. It's the, actually the car's fault. Now, when you ask people, and we've actually done this, we've gone to lawmakers uh, in the United States and we've gone to you know, people in other groups outside of IEEE and said, okay, who should be at fault? if a car, autonomous car, gets in an accident? And the natural answer is, well, it's the car manufacturer's fault. They built a vehicle that was imperfect, therefore they're at fault. 
And there's a certain logic to that. The problem though is if the manufacturer is always at fault when an autonomous vehicle gets in an accident, then the car manufacturer can't make any money because at some point, every car they build is going to get into an accident. And in fact, the autonomous system that is driving the car isn't going to be imperfect because all systems are. Perhaps down the road, we can get something that approaches perfection, but at least for the first couple generations of autonomous vehicles, they are going to be imperfect and they're going to get in accidents. And when they get in accidents, when they cause an accident, if the manufacturer is liable, they are going to lose money on every car they sell, which means they won't sell any cars. What IEEE USA is looking at is creating some sort of insurance mandate. Uh, I'm not sure how this is done in India, but in the United States, every driver on the road is required to have insurance. They're required to have insurance that says if they cause an accident, their insurance will cover the expense. What we're looking at requiring and what we're suggesting policymakers look at is, is a similar system where if you want to buy an autonomous vehicle, you have to have insurance that says if your car causes an accident, the insurance will pay the expense. What happens if you do that over time is if certain autonomous vehicles get in lots of accidents because there are problems with the autonomous system, the insurance companies will stop insuring them, saying, no, no, we won't sell you a policy for that particular car because that particular car gets in lots of accidents, which will force the companies to do a better job. So you're using market forces to improve the vehicles over time while still allowing them on the road before they are completely perfect. There are some problems with that basic approach and some policymakers don't like it, but that's the kind of approach we're looking at. If any of you have ideas on how to solve this, what is really a legal question, not a technical question, but it requires a legal understanding. If you have any ideas, we would love to hear them. Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, answer. Uh, Sir, uh, I have uh, one more question. Uh, actually, everywhere in USA or in India and all over the world, uh, people are talking about energy conservation. And suppose uh, we are uh, going to policy makers and we are saying energy conservation is very necessary in this one. So uh, they are saying, uh, okay, uh, what, uh, what do you uh, mean about power theft? Okay, so how can you control power theft? So we are concerned to us energy conservation, but uh, uh, about the power theft. So sir, uh, what, uh, how we can discuss to policy makers for the power theft? What's uh, um, your idea? IEEE USA has actually, we just uh, are, are about to publish a white paper looking at the, 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 the energy systems particularly the electrical grid uh, in the United States. And so we have a, a fairly comprehensive list of things that can be done uh, to improve energy conservation and make the electrical grid more efficient. At, at the same time, it becomes more reliable. Um, IEEE's focus is on the grid itself. Um, you know, there's power generation and you can talk about solar and wind and nuclear and which we do. But policymakers in the United States, and my understanding, by the way, is that policymakers in India are more likely to have a technical background than policymakers in the United States. So I think your job is actually easier than ours in some of these cases. Um, but most policymakers in the United States don't really understand how the electrical grid works. They kind of get, they understand how energy is generated and they understand how energy is used, but they don't understand what goes on between those two things. Uh, and so we spend an awful lot of time simply explaining the electrical grid and how energy is transmitted from the power plants to the consumer, to policymakers. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to improve both the efficiency of the grid and the reliability of the grid by looking at 
kind of the, the middle part of the process, the, the transmission systems. Uh, clearly, power generation is something policymakers need to look at. Uh, to give you an example, um, in California, this past summer, uh, they faced rolling blackouts uh, because they kept running, running out of electricity. And policymakers saying, well, we don't know what's going on. How is this happening? Why do we not have electricity? And the blackouts were happening right around six to seven o'clock in the evening uh, in California and it was happening most days. And our IEEE members in California went to them with a very simple reason that that was happening. And the reason was California was relying too much on solar power, which as you all know, stops working when the sun sets. What happened in California was the state government had caused a number of natural gas, excuse me, natural gas power plants to be shut down because they were worried about emissions and they had shut down the state's only nuclear power plant. And they'd replace that load with solar panels, predominantly some wind, some a few other types of power, but mostly through solar, which is fantastic because California gets a lot of sun, but it doesn't get a lot of sun at night. And because their um, energy portfolio was out of balance, California kept running out of energy. And so, there's a role of technologists to go in and say, and there's power engineers in particular to say, listen, solar power is wonderful, but you can only do it up to this point and then it doesn't work quite as well anymore. We can also look at the electrical grid and say, well, if you do these things, if you use these technologies, if you build these redundancies into the system, you can increase energy efficiency at the same time you're increasing reliability and re and and survivability of course california has natural disasters uh, earthquakes and wildfires and all sorts of other things uh, more so than most other parts of the united states uh, and so i think that's the role that ieee members are playing in california is helping policymakers understand the system understanding the the potential of technology, but also understanding the limitations of technology and to say, this solution will fix this problem, but will also create these problems. And this is how you work around it. Uh, and that's what IEEE USA and more specifically our members in the United States spend a lot of our time doing. And I think it's, it's a great service to the community. It's great service to society. And it's something that only engineers can do. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, excellent answer. Uh, sir, uh, I have my next question, and uh, it is Uh, we are engineers. What engineers are doing for? Um, that, that, it's a good question, and we get that question from policymakers every now and then. But frankly, most of the time we have to tell them <laughs> because they don't think to ask. Um, I can tell you there are some fantastic stories about engineers in the United States, but also all over the world, who have jumped into the Corona situation to develop technical solutions to some of the problems we were confronted with. Um, we know of IEEE members who made some startlingly quick innovations in, for example, ventilators. Sorry, don't know why my mic just turned itself off. Sorry about that. Um, I'm just going to start over because I don't know when my mic went on mute. Uh, one of the fun stories and, and I think very important stories about the coronavirus in the United States and globally is the role that IEEE members have played in trying to come up with solution. Um, I know in the United States, 
uh, IEEE members have jumped in to develop very quickly uh, affordable technology, for example, in ventilator technology, uh, machines to help people with coronavirus breathe. Uh, there was a severe concern in the United States that we, we would run out of these ventilators. Apparently, we don't have a tremendous amount of them. Um, and if hundreds of thousands of Americans needed to go on a ventilator, we just didn't have the capacity at the beginning of the, 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 the virus, uh, the plague. And so IEEE members in the United States developed relatively cheap, relatively easy to build technology that would work. Um, most ventilators, as I understand it, are very complicated machines that do lots and lots of things, but COVID didn't need them to do a lot of things. And so engineers dropped, jumped in and developed fairly simple ventilators that would do exactly what Corona needed, uh, Corona victims needed. Um, without doing everything else, making them available very quickly. I know a number of engineering companies in the United States shifted their production very quickly to produce personal protection equipment, masks, face masks, gloves, robes, other things that medical workers and other first responders needed um, to respond to deal with COVID. And then you have engineers that are working on a solution you know, you think about vaccines, for example, that is predominantly doctors doing the vaccine work, but it is not exclusively doctors. There is a role that engineers need to play in developing the equipment to produce vaccines, to produce the distribution systems for vaccines, um, and to develop the medical equipment needed to develop the vaccines. You know, uh, Medical research doesn't just require doctors, it requires engineers to develop the equipment that doctors need to develop medical solutions to these sort of problems. And then there's another side to this. Once we have a vaccine, and rumor has it, we may be close to getting a vaccine. Um, I've heard, you take all this with a grain of salt, but I hear that we, in the United States, vaccines may start to be distributed to people on as early as December 12th, which is pretty exciting. I suspect it'll be a little after that, but the point is it's not that far away. Okay, once we have a vaccine that works, producing it in large quantities will require engineering. And there are engineers that have already developed a process for producing vaccines insufficient quality quantities to start, you know, inoculating millions of people and ultimately billions of people. Once the vaccine is produced, it needs to be distributed to major hospitals and minor hospitals and little tiny towns in the middle of nowhere quickly. That system, that distribution system is really an engineering challenge. And there are IEEE members involved in developing it, excuse me. Uh, and then, you know, you have the equipment, that, the, the syringes that need to be produced to distribute the vaccine. You need uh, equipment to ship the vaccine. Most vaccines have to be refrigerated. So how do you do that in massive quantities very quickly all across the United States and then all across the world? And engineers have roles to play in all that. And I am, this is one of the reasons I'm so proud to work for IEEE and to work, frankly, for all of you uh, is because I know that IEEE members are right in the middle of all of that and that IEEE members will do heroic things that will probably never really be recognized, but will be heroic nonetheless to help the planet overcome uh, the, the, the coronavirus. And I hope many of you get to play a role in that as well. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. So, uh, if uh, any participant is having more question, then uh, they are invited. Can ask, please. And again, Shrikant, th I see your comment there. Thank you again for including me in this. This is a uh, tremendous honor. Uh, Shambhavi, now you can continue, please. Okay, sure. uh, Professor Harrison, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Professor Harrison, I have a question. Uh, for like uh, when when an engineer files a patent or when uh, when an engineer makes something or a company files a patent, uh, what's the role he plays in relation to the policy of uh, that uh, that topic? Like uh, if a company makes something, they file a patent, right? So mm -hmm. 
uh, what if what if they, when they program something uh if there's something to program in that patent does the policy like does the government recognize that program if there is any like issue or if there is any errors that can lead to a major hazard like is there any like a government or a community like in inside the government that sees the faults of that uh, patent um i think there's actually two issues in your question there's the issue of the patent and then there's issues of liability of the product typically a patent wouldn't now i'm speaking from the united states uh i understand the american intellectual property legal system um reasonably well i don't understand india's legal system around patents um i under, it, it's probably similar you know, we're, we both come from an english background on these sorts of things so i suspect your system is similar to ours but i don't know that but in the united states uh, it is unlikely that a patent itself would be found to be to have some sort of liability um the liability would come from the implementation of that patent. So let me deal with two questions one at a time. First is the patent itself. IEEE USA spends a great deal of time working with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, helping them understand technology, stay ahead of technology, and frankly, make sure that people that develop new technology keep and can use the rights to, that, to, to their ideas. Um, frankly, IEEE USA is very concerned that the American patent system is tilting too far in favor of large corporations with lots and lots and lots of money and lawyers to the detriment of smaller inventors. And so we spend a lot of time trying to protect independent inventors, smaller inventors, smaller companies to make sure that they can benefit from their ideas just like the big guys. Uh, and so you got to structure the, the, the legal system around patents correctly. We also have to help patent examiners stay on top of innovations. You know, you guys, engineers, um, are moving so fast and developing technology so quickly that it's hard for patent examiners to keep up. But if they're going to do their job, they have to. Now, you raised another issue, which is the issue of software patents which in the United States is a very controversial issue. There was a, a, a legal decision uh, several years ago that suggests that software cannot be patented um, in the United States, which is a problem. Uh, and so we're working with the legal system directly with judges in some cases, filing what are called amicus briefs and court cases in the United States um, to help judges understand the implication here. The second question there is liability. Um, typically under the American legal system, if a product is made based on a patent and the product is found to have a flaw, the problem is the product and the legal system wouldn't necessarily do anything about the patent, but the free market would. Clearly a patent that results in a product that is flawed and therefore creates liability problems for the manufacturer is going to be abandoned. Uh, as I think we all know, there are plenty of things that have gotten patents over the years that are completely useless <laughs> and will never ever be produced, which is fine. Um, and I think that's what happens in this case. If a product, if a patent has a flaw in it, it simply stops being used. But of course, manufacturers, companies that produce a product based on that patent will end up getting sued, um, which is a problem for them. And I hope I answered your question there. Uh, yes, thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir, uh, thank you. Uh, any more questions from the participants? If okay. anyone has any questions, they can mention it on, in the comment section I'll, and I'll take them up. And you are all more than welcome to reach out to me directly if you think of anything or if there's any other service I can provide you in the future. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, yes, sir. For sure. I think no one has more, any more questions. And okay. thank you so much, sir, honorable sir, for your precious time. Indeed, it was a very knowledgeable session. We appreciate you being here and guiding us in the webinar.
It is also a great inspiration for us because you have delivered your presentation from Washington at 3.30 a.m. Now, I would like to call upon Organizing Secret Secretary Dr. Khadim Moin Siddiqui to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, a very good afternoon. Honorable Chief Guest Come Speaker, Professor Russell Harrison, Director, Government Relations, IEEE USA, Esteemed Director, BBD ITM, Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chauhan, Respected HOD, EE and EN, Professor Rafiq Ahmad, All Respected HODs, DI, Key Administrative Officers, BBD ITM, Editor, Professor Dharmesh Srivastav, BBD ITM Magazine, Faculty Participants, Student Participants, and Volunteers. It's my proud privilege to propose vote of thanks on the event, Inauguration of Institution Magazine Volume 2, and webinar on ingenious role in public policy. First of all, my sincere thanks and gratitude to Honorable Chief Guest Come Speaker, Professor Russell Harrison, Director, Government Relations, IEEE USA, who has accepted our invitation gladly and also delivered this presentation from 3.30 p.m. morning, Washington time. Honorable Sir, as you have mentioned in your email that you are excited about talking to our students and BBD ITM fraternity, this gave us so much motivation and encouragement in organizing the program. Honorable Sir, no doubt we have learned a lot from your today's talk and will not hesitate to say that you are one of the most influencing and dedicated personality of the world. Honorable Sir, today we have really inspired from you and highly appreciating your contributions for the humanity. Again, thank you so much, sir, for give us, giving us your precious time. I take this opportunity to, to express our sincere thanks and deep gratitude to Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chauhan, Honorable Director, BBDITM Lucknow, for his esteemed presence among, amongst us and for presiding over the event the valuable thoughts that he has expressed on this occasion and really motivation, inspiration for amongst us. Honorable Sir, without your productive mentorship, useful and critical guidance, we are unable to organize this kind of program successfully. Thank you so much, sir, for your untiring efforts and constructive guidance. Further, I would like to express my sincere thanks to respected HOD, Professor Rafiq Ahmad, for his able leadership, continuous and moral support. And further thanks to department in charge, Professor Shivanand and all electrical engineering and electrical and electronics engineering faculty members for your time to time support. Key administrative officers, VBD ITM, faculty participants, student participants, volunteers for joining us and making the event successful. At last, at last, thanks IEEE BBD ITM student branch and IEEE Women in Engineering Executive Committee, especially Mr. Sri Khan Singh, Mr. Maruk Nandan Tripathi, Ms. Sakshi Piriyam, Mr. Avinash Gupta, Ms. Shivali Prasad, Ms. Anshika Rai, Ms. Vijaya Shukla, Ms. Yashika Yado, Ms. Shriya Rai, and today's program anchors Ms. Kirti Agrawal and Ms. Sambhavi for your hard work with great enthusiasm to conduct this program in the effective way. Again, thank you so much all. Thank you so much, sir. Before the session ends, we are going to circulate the feedback form. It is my kind request to all the participants, please fill the feedback form. Now I would like to invite respected HOD, W -E and EN departments, Professor Rafiq Ahmed, who is also the IEEE BBD ITM student branch counselor, to declare the event close. Thank you. Thank you, Anchor. Thank you so much for the joining us. I declare the program closed. Thank you. <laughs>